I'm Andrew Schwartz, and you're listening to The Truth of the Matter, a podcast by CSIS where we break down the top policy issues of the day and talk with the people that can help us best understand what's really going on. To get to the truth of the matter about the latest in the war in Ukraine and also about the United States and Israel and Iran, we have with us Dr. Elliot Cohen, who is our Arlie Burke Chair in Strategy at CSIS. Elliot, of course, is a legendary former dean of Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and a former senior official in the United States government. Elliot, you are my favorite guest to ever have on the podcast, so I'm so happy you're back. (laughs) Well, that's too kind. Thanks very much. It's always good to be with you. So a lot's changed since we last sat down to talk about what's going on in Ukraine. Where do you think we are right now? It's, it, it feels like it's changing. Something's changing, but I can't really put my finger on what it is. Well, I think the, the first thing to recognize is that this war is really a watershed event. You know, I, I don't particularly care for Dmitry Trenin, who, even though he was a GRU, in other words, military intelligence colonel, somehow ended up as being in charge of Carnegie's Moscow office. But he, he said something which I think is right which is that this is a, represents a rupture in the relationship between Russia and the West. And I think that has quite profound significance that's going to go on for years and years and years after this phase of the war concludes. I think – so that's one, one thing that I think we're now confronting. There's no going back in any way on this. The other thing is I think you've, you're seeing a, a continuation of the pattern – whereby the West does the right thing by the Ukrainians, but tends to do it late and in some cases a bit grudgingly. So we finally had the decision to begin sending modern main battle tanks to Ukraine, which is the right decision. But that decision could have been taken, should have been taken in, let's say, September. And that way, those machines would have been available for fighting in the next couple of months, which now they most likely will not. And in a similar way, you know, I think eventually we're going to get to the point where we give the Ukrainians the kind of long-range munitions, various kinds of missiles and rockets to hit Russian logistical rare areas. I just hope it it won't be too late. The the Russians are digging in. They're doubling down on uh, their effort. They are clearly planning on launching more offensives. I don't think there's any prospect for a negotiated settlement that I can see in the – certainly in the next six months or so. Uh, and so I think we're headed for a period of very intense fighting in, in which the Ukrainians are increasingly well-armed but not quite enough uh, and not quite at the scale that they need. So we'll see. Meanwhile, the, the Russian military has been suffering terribly but Russian leaders don't particularly care about that. Elliot, you mentioned the tanks. Now the Ukrainians are pushing for air assistance in the form of planes delivered to them. Poland wanted to give uh, the Ukrainians MiGs months back, and we, the United States and the Biden administration, didn't want that to happen. Why do you think the United States doesn't want, at this time at least, the Ukrainians to get air power? Well, uh, there are several reasons. I mean, one is a, a kind of a reasonable calculation that they really need other things instead and a belief that they're uh, – even for the United States, there are limited resources we can provide. But I would have – feel better about that if I really thought we were pressing the accelerator on long-range missiles like a TACMS, which they clearly need. The less – reputable explanation is, as it's always been, fear of escalation. Although, you know, what exactly the, the red line is for the Russians, there, I mean, if there is such a thing as a red line, is, is not particularly clear. And I think there's been, throughout this conflict, a really unfortunate degree of self-deterrence. Uh, so I think that's, that's there. The, the Ukrainians, I think, would like to push for, and we should want them to succeed in basically re-equipping themselves as a Western-style military. They can operate that equipment, although in the case of the F-16, it would take additional training and so forth, but to really get them away from Russian-era weapons. You know, the truth is the, the original plan to give them MiG-29s, it might have been useful, but the MiG-29 itself is a pretty old system. 
it's not really the same kind of multi-role fighter that a, even an F-16 is. And I, you know, I'm sure the Ukrainians want it. At the moment, I think that's it's not absolutely clear. It's the most important thing for them to get. But you know, in general, my view is give them everything short of nuclear weapons. Anything that you think that they would know how to use. And they continually surprise us being able, by being able to learn these systems very fast. Give it to them. And with something like the F-16, there are thousands of those things out there. We have surplus F-16s. A lot of other countries do as well. You know, they could re-equip themselves that way. I think part of what the Ukrainians want to do is establish the precedent that basically they will be armed from Western arsenal. And I think they also want to have a psychological effect on the Russians. Because the Russians do understand that at the end of the day, our military technology is a lot better than theirs. And to some extent, this is part of a, a, um, a psychological war that's, that's going on, which the Ukrainians really need to convince the Russians that they are the ones who don't have a hope of success. And so the, the hesitancy on the part of the Biden administration is that they seem to believe that if we were to give the Ukrainians attack arms, long range missiles or fighter planes, that those type of weapons could be used to strike inside of Russia. And that would then represent an escalation where we don't know what would happen. Right. Is that is that really the logic? Yeah. Well, there, I mean, there are a couple of things, of course, that are I think that's true. There are a couple of things that are deeply problematic about that. First, on both a strategic and a moral level. So why is it OK for the Russians to blow up apartment buildings and power plants and hospitals in Ukraine? But the Ukrainians can't punch back at military targets in Russia. Second problem with that is the Ukrainians actually do throw punches into Russia periodically, and that hasn't caused uh, the world to end at all. And the third problem with that argument is, you know, you can set limits. You can tell the Ukrainians, okay, we'll give you ATACMs, but uh, you won't get any if you fire them across the old border into Russia. I mean, maybe that would be a good idea. I don't know. But you could do it. I, th I think it's, you know, it's a reflection of really two things. One is, uh, I hate to say it, but a certain kind of timidity. Maybe, you know, maybe that comes with being responsible, which obviously I don't have to be. But I think is in any case really excessive as a reading of where the, the Russians are. But I think some of this too is the product of not really taking war as war. This is a topic you and I have talked about before. Yes. There just isn't the sense of urgency, the you know, desire to really drive and and win. And that reflects a combination of things, Re reflects the intellectual culture of the people who go into government these days. It reflects the experience, I think, of the last 20 years of conflict that we've been engaged in, where you had plenty of time to have endless reviews and tinker at the margins and so on. But, but it's not what you know, the dynamics of real war are like. Uh, I'm writing a, a piece for Foreign Affairs, and one of my lines in it is that we keep on telling teenagers that speed kills, which is true if you're driving a car, but in war, slowness kills also. The other thing I wanted to ask you about, Elliot, is what about bringing Ukraine into NATO? What is really behind the hesitancy there? So, uh, I mean, obviously, you know, once you have a, once you have a country in NATO, I think the way Americans have certainly always interpreted it, and other, some other countries have not, is, you know, the Russians invade you, the United States will send its own troops there, and uh, we will fight a war to defend you. And I think President Biden is very much of that view. That's how he understands Article 5. It's not exactly what Article 5 of the North Atlantic Treaty says, but it's, it's close enough. So I think that's behind the hesitancy. Now, what's interesting there, though, is I, I think we're seeing signs that that reluctance, which was pretty much universal before the war started, before the Russians invaded Ukraine, is dissipating. And I'll give you just two pieces of evidence. One is Henry Kissinger, who has tended to be very sort of restrained, I would say, in his view of this war, recently said that he thinks Ukraine should be admitted to NATO. And the other person who's made the case, who we will be hearing more from, is the new president of the Czech Republic, Petr Pavel, who himself is, I think, former chairman of the NATO Military Committee. He's very distinguished and also a very forceful public personality. And I think you're going to be seeing as part of whatever 
package people put together to at least conclude this stage of the fighting that you will see either Ukraine in NATO or with a set of arrangements and guarantees which almost amount to the same thing. So meanwhile, we're continuing to send aid. We're continuing to send military aid and money. And we just committed to 2.5 billion military aid package to Ukraine. Do you think it's enough? No. I mean, it's good. And it's quite an extraordinary amount of aid. But you can only tell that it's enough when the Ukrainians say to us, please stop sending us so much stuff. I mean, war is an intrinsically and incredibly wasteful activity. You cannot calculate to a nicety what exactly it is that you require. Now, this additional $2.5 billion, though, may be, turn out to be significant in this way. We haven't really said what's in the package. And there has been some talk that there'll be longer range weapons, not ATACMS. ATACMS packs a very powerful wallop. It's a single missile. But there has been talk of sending something called the ground launch small diameter bomb, which is a smaller missile that fires out of the, the HIMARS system. But if, if you fire half a dozen of those, you get roughly the same explosive potential that you got from an ATACM. So in, in theory, if that's what we end up giving the Ukrainians, we may be giving them at long last weapons that can reach deep. And, and the reason why that's important is HIMARS was incredibly effective, these, you know, the mobile uh, rocket system, because they could really devastate Russian supply dumps and command posts. Well, the Russians are not fools, and they've adjusted. And what they've done is they've moved their logistics centers back you know, some tens of kilometers. So they're basically out of the range of HIMARS. They're still in Ukrainian territory, though. You know, they're still dependent on railroads. They still have supply dumps. They still have fixed command posts. Once those become vulnerable, then they're in a very different and more, much more difficult position in terms of holding on to the territory they've seized. Is it a turning point now in this war that Russia seems to be just sending a barbaric amount of young conscripts who aren't very well trained, obviously, into battle. It's barbaric for both the soldiers that they're sending and it's barbaric against the Ukrainians. Does this represent something of a turning point to you? Well, unfortunately, I think the war started barbarically. I mean, the, the, you know, if you look simply at the massacres the Russian soldiers began committing from the first day. I mean, I've, as we discussed, I visited Irpin, which is basically just a suburb of Kiev. You know, they committed massacres there. So they, they committed massacres wherever they came. So it's gotten worse, no question about it. I think what it mainly is, it's a sign that Vladimir Putin and the circle around him are doubling down on this war. They do not want to compromise peace. They have not relinquished their the objectives with which they started the war. They're reverting to, you know, very standard old Russian techniques, which is just, you know, pile the bodies high and try to overwhelm your opponent by mass, to some extent intelligently employed, but mainly by mass, and you're willing to tolerate very, very high levels of casualties, which would be unacceptable in a country like the United States. So I think it means that we're in for a very difficult and bloody uh, spring and summer. Have casualties continued to just rise uh, with, yes. these, with Russia? Yes. I mean, I was told they, they lost something like 50,000 casualties in January alone. Uh, it, it could well be. The, the British recently released an estimate that the Russians have taken 180,000 casualties. Now, when you use the word casualties, you have to be careful. Are you talking about dead? Are you talking about dead, wounded, missing? Um, yeah, off the battlefield. Yeah, basically, basically right? off the battlefield, which yeah. I think is what the British were saying. If you look at the Ukrainian general staff, whose estimates actually I think have turned out to be, you know, maybe a little bit high, but not terribly so, they're, they're reporting the Russians – losing 700 to 900 dead every day, which is a horrific, it's a horrific number. I mean, to take a uh, comparison, you know, in the most difficult periods in Vietnam, during the Vietnam War, we were losing several hundred American soldiers a week. Right. And on a smaller, on a larger population base. So th these are very, very significant casualties. Now, they're, 
pretty they're more limited to the poorer and more rural parts of the population but it's it's still a lot and the more the russians draft people and or mobilize people the more likely they are to find themselves in a situation where this really does begin to affect middle class russians and even upper class russians more directly than it has thus far thus far it hasn't i'll, I'll add just one one other point uh, which i think tells you something about the nature of the Russian elite's commitment to this war. In World War II, Joseph Stalin's son served on the front lines. He was captured. Stalin did nothing to try to get him out. In this war, the, you know, the sons of the elite are running around with draft exemptions. So they're, they're not serving on the front lines. Right. At what point, though, does it become a domestic problem for Russia when it does seep into the middle class and into the elites? Is that when it really becomes a problem or does it even become a problem then? Uh, I don't think anybody really knows. You know, the nature of an authoritarian system like this, particularly Russia, where the population is so used to being passive, is uh, there's a lot of stuff that's sort of subterranean and suddenly things, suddenly things begin to crack. I, I, unfortunately, I tend to think that you won't see a major change in, unless either the elite really begins to feel this personally with, with losses, and I think they, they, they'll try to insulate people from that, or if somehow Putin is removed from the scene, whether by a coup or by illness or accident or something like that. I think as long as he is in charge, he will continue to play the game in such a way that the losses will pile up. People will be more and more unhappy about it, but the war will go on. You know, Elliot, months ago we were talking about Russia potentially using tactical nuclear weapons. There hasn't been a lot of talk about that lately. Has, the, has that threat sort of dissipated or is it still lingering out there? I don't think the threat was ever real. We, I see. We, we practically encouraged the Russians to threaten this because the one thing – uh, some of our leaders very foolishly talked about it. So, well, we don't want this to escalate to nuclear war. Well, that guarantees that, guess what? Vladimir Putin and and people around him will begin talking about nuclear weapons. But, you know, just to recap very quickly, there aren't any particularly good targets for the use of tactical nuclear weapons. Uh, the use of a tactical nuclear weapon could blow back in a very direct way on Russia. But, but more importantly, the long-term consequences of the use of nuclear weapons in any form, even as a demonstration shot, is that, you know, you almost would guarantee nuclear proliferation in places like Finland and Poland, Ukraine at some point, Kazakhstan. And then the other dimension, which I think is really critical here, the Chinese have zero interest in seeing uh, the Russians flash a nuclear weapon because if people get the notion that great powers will actually, you know, not only threaten but actually use nuclear weapons, that guarantees nuclear uh, proliferation in their neighborhood with Japan, South Korea, Taiwan, Vietnam. And the Chinese really don't want that. And I'm sure that they have conveyed that to the Russians. So I think the it, it's not that there's no risk. There is a risk because the Russians uh, do think about nuclear weapons differently than we do. But I think it's been really wildly exaggerated. Is it in China's interest for this conflict to continue, though? Do they want to see a diminished Russia so then they can sort of draw every bit of energy out of Russia on the cheap and they can really control Russia more than they have been able to in the past? No, I, I mean, for that, you might want to talk to our, uh, our colleague, Jude Blanchett. I, I don't think so. I think they optimally they would like to see – they would probably like to see the, the conflict frozen right where it is. I think they understand how destabilizing it would be if there was really a cataclysm in, in Europe and the result is that Western Europe rearms in a very large way. I, I don't think they want to see Russia weakened. I, I'm not sure what level of confidence they have in the ability of the Russians to pull this off. To some extent, they may say, well, this helps in that it takes the United States' eye off the Indo-Pacific. But in the long run, it's not really good for them because it, it, this is stimulating additional defense spending in the U.S. But, but more importantly, it's, it has stimulated additional defense spending in their neighborhood. You, you look at Japan. So the Japanese, after spending 1 percent of GDP on defense for decades and decades, are going to double that. And why are they doing that? Well, I mean, a lot of that, 
I think is is driven by what they're seeing in Ukraine. And it's that, and that in turn has a number of components, one of which is they see this, – this is a point that was made to us by our, one of our other colleagues, Chris Johnstone, that if, if you put up a really good fight, the United States will show up to help you. So from the Chinese point of view, I think they would like to see this thing stop. They don't want to see Russia defeated. They're probably worried about you know, internal chaos in Russia. But they're also probably shaking their heads at Russian military performance and Russian statecraft. One last point on this is I think it's fair to say, and I don't know if the Chinese see it this way as well, that it's not entirely coincidental that the West European – the European line on China has gotten tougher even during this war. And I think that's because it's caused a – complete reframing of how people understand international politics in Europe. Elliot, you know, some of the talk I've heard around town is that even if Vladimir Putin wanted to stop, and there is no indication that he wants to stop, that there aren't a lot of pathways for him or off-ramps for him to de-escalate and get out of this. What, what do you think? Are there any pathways? Are there any off-ramps? Uh, I think there were, and he got rid of them, particularly got rid of them by annexing those four oblasts or districts of Ukraine and making them part of Russia because, you know, at that point, he's then committed to defending what he has defined as Russian territory, which a lot of Russians now believe is Russian territory. And there's no way – first, they don't control those all of those four oblasts. I think he's going to try to get control of them. At that point, he might call for a ceasefire, but he's not going to get that. And, you know, he is not going to be willing to be the guy who gave up Russian Russian territory. Part of his calculation may be that unlike Khrushchev, for example, or Boris Yeltsin, he may not have the option of a comfortable retirement so long as he stays out of politics. It may be a much more difficult set of circumstances for him personally, and I don't think he wants that. And, and finally, I think he – I've been reading some of his speeches and articles. I think he sees himself as a truly historic figure in the mold of some of the great czars of Russian history. And, you know, guys like that don't cut small deals. And so once you begin to think of yourself as a hero with a capital H – I think you make it very, very difficult to backtrack. And, and of course, you know, he's not probably getting the information flow that would lead him to realize that you know, maybe it's time to give it a rest. Well, that is not a lot of cause for optimism. I want to change tracks for a second about, and talk a little bit about Israel and Iran and the United States. Just last week, the Israelis launched a drone attack inside of Iran and took out what was a, I think it was an ammunition depot or some military storage unit. Just days before that, the United States and Israel were conducting massive military exercises, including our aircraft carriers. I think it was 180,000 pounds of, of munitions. What's going on with the United States and Israel? So, again, I'm not privy to what the U.S. government is thinking about. The when the Obama administration was negotiating the uh, JCPOA, the, the original Iran deal, we were doing a lot with the Israelis. There was a lot of intelligence sharing. There were also exercises and so forth. Frankly, I think a lot of that was designed to you know, keep the Israelis quiet or to reassure them so they wouldn't lash out. I think this time it may be a little bit different. I think this time it's conceivable that we are taking seriously the possibility of doing something to actually stop an Iranian – nuclear program. For the other things, the Israelis have been – and the Iranians have been conducting a covert war now for years. And that includes attacks on one another's commercial shipping at uh, sea. On the Israeli side, it's included some very successful assassinations, including of um, – I forget his first name – Fakhrizada, the, the father of the Iranian nuclear bomb. So this is – I think the, the context here is – this semi-covert war, which has occurred not just in Syria and Lebanon, where, where it has, 
but also on the high seas and in Iran proper. And, of course, the Iranians have been trying to do the same back to the Israelis, but much less successfully. I, I do think that what's different here is that the moment of truth has finally come on the Iranian nuclear program. You know, the one of the, the flaws I always thought in the original Iran deal was it basically was just going to buy you time because the limitations, the sanctions, so on, were all due to come off after 10, 15 years, something like that. But, but time to do what? And, you know, despite all the sanctions, despite the sabotage, the assassinations, the Iranian nuclear program has continued to advance. And they may already have enough material for nuclear weapons, according to some reports. So you're now confronted with the choice. Do you basically stand by while they assemble a small nuclear arsenal? Or do you try to destroy it? And I, you know, it's not clear to me which way the Israelis would go. The thing that is different now is that you have an almost open alliance between Israel and some of the key Gulf states, which, of course, gives the Israelis more, more options. It's also hard for me to tell where exactly President Biden is on this. I mean, I, I tend to think that the United States on the whole has been reluctant to get back into the Persian Gulf in a big military way. So I, despite the big exercises and so on, I have trouble seeing it, but I might well be wrong. I think in, you know, Biden is a, is a much more forceful character, uh, which can be both good and bad, uh, than President Obama was on these kinds of things. And he would, be, he would certainly be more likely to authorize the use of military force, and I don't think he would get pushback from the Republicans. But at, at the end of the day, I think the tendency will be to try to avoid that sort of decision. Has the leadership, has the change in leadership in Israel changed this equation somewhat, or is it really just a continuum of, of national security interests for Israel? I think it's a continuum. You know, Bibi Netanyahu, despite his other very serious failings and despite the internal Israeli political crisis, which is real and, and very concerning, but as a national security figure, he was actually more cautious than people think, more measured than, than people think. And I think at the upper echelons of the Israeli government, on the whole, there's been consensus about this. I mean, there is some fundamental disagreement between those who think that they really need to take action to stop the Iranian program. And there, there's been a minority view, which I think has actually been represented even in the intelligence community there, that you can learn to live with this with a, a robust deterrent posture. But no, I think on this issue, actually, you're going to be looking at continuity. And also, in addition to the nuclear program that Iran is pursuing, Israel is also quite concerned with their conventional military buildup, aren't they? Like thus, you know, for instance, the ability to deliver a nuclear bomb, which they don't currently have. Well, the, the, the Iranians have invested very substantial resources and on the whole fairly successfully in ballistic missiles and cruise missiles and drones. And we have not been paying, certainly publicly paying a whole lot of attention to that, but it's, it's quite real and it does Again, the Israelis have been thinking about this for a long time. That's why they've developed layered anti-ballistic missile defenses. But they, uh, as you just see, the fact that the Iranians are now actually a major supplier of some of these systems to Russia tells us a lot. It tells us something about Russia, that they've run out of their own systems, but it also tells us something about the Iranians, that they actually have capacity to deliver. And the Israelis have to be thinking about that. Again, a lot of what they do in Syria, where there's you know, repeated Israeli attacks, some of which are reported and some of which are not, uh, that's explained by that, their concern about exactly that, you know, flocks of drones and ballistic missiles and all the rest. Is Russia and Iran, are they friends of convenience when it is convenient for them? Or is there something, is there a stronger bond between Iran and Russia? I, I think on the whole... All these relationships are essentially transactional. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that they're not quite strong. I mean, I think you know, Russian and Iranian interests overlap to quite a considerable degree. I think the Israelis have, have had trouble wrapping their heads around the fact that from, their, from the Russian point of view, 
they're going to be more beholden to the the Iranians after, particularly after this war, than they ever were to to Israel. And if they have to make a choice, their their choice will be to tilt to the Iranians. I mean, the same way that the Indians, I think, are maybe gradually kind of waking up to the fact that uh, yes, they could have a very good relationship with Russia or the thought they did and get a lot of their arms from them. But if Russia is ever in a position where it has to choose between India and China, there's no question which country it's going to choose. It'll be China. Elliot Cohen, thank you so much for all of your insight on this. This is a lot to think about, and I really appreciate it. Always good to be with you, Andrew. If you enjoyed this podcast, check out our larger suite of CSIS podcasts from Into Africa, The Asia Chessboard, China Power, AIDS 2020, The Trade Guys, Smart Women, Smart Power, and more. You can listen to them all on major streaming platforms like iTunes and Spotify. Visit csis.org slash podcasts to see our full catalog 